it's my first time at CppCon. Uh, I've thought about going for a lot of years and now kind of uh, regretting that I didn't go sooner. We thank our panelists, we thank you for showing up. And what we're gonna do here is talk about what the Standards Committee does, but we want you to ask questions. So we've got, uh, where is the floor mic for questions? Is that over here? Okay. So we're gonna try an experiment. We have one cue, and that'll help us load balance, and we can see you better. So feel free to come up and ask questions of the committee about what are we doing, how do we work, I'm Herb Sutter, I'm the chair of the committee, and I've got myself to be moderator so that I wouldn't have to answer any questions. I can just field them to our panel here. So could you each maybe introduce yourselves in a sentence or two, uh, what you do in the committee, the highlights, and the thing you're most interested in actively working on right now? Is this on? Hi, my name is Pablo Halpern. Um, I've been on the committee since uh, 2007, I think. Um, I was, uh, I, I worked mostly on library stuff, uh, but also some on parallelism. Um, and in the library, I'm, I'm kind of at fault for a lot of the allocator stuff. And um, so I like to take more credit for the parallelism stuff. Hi everyone, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, my name is Inba Levy, I'm LAWG uh, chair uh, since recently. Um, I've been working on multiple things, I guess, um, but uh, nothing comes to mind right now. So, so be before we let that get away, not everybody may know what LEWG Chair is. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this is the Library Evolution uh, work group, the one that is in charge of uh, design of the standard library. Uh, yeah, so. Hi, I'm Daisy Holman. I am the... Uh, SG9 chair, which is the study group number nine, which is the, the study group that, that is concerned with ranges. Um, I was, was not the chair of just as of recently, so anything that's in the library right now is not my fault. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, 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 things that are my fault, um, I've worked on executors, so the fact that we don't have them is part of, yeah. Um, I've worked on, uh, I, I worked on M MD SPAN. Um, I worked on Atomic Ref. Um, I worked on, I've worked on generic programming models in general for a number of different things. Uh, Tag Invoke was my fault, even though other people carried it out. Uh, so yeah, that's some of the things. Oh, I've been involved in the committee since 2016. Hello? Yeah, that's. Uh, my name is Nina Ranz. Uh, I've been on the committee since 2013. It's 10 years anniversary this year. Uh, I know. <laughs> I'm also the committee secretary, and I am recently app been appointed as the SG22 chair, which is the liaison group between C and C++. Um, I mostly sit in the core group, which is the group that manages the wording of the first 16 chapters, which is the core syntax of the language. Um, but at the moment, I'm actually working on uh, library types. It's optional and a variant that are allocator aware with Pablo too. Uh, hi, uh, Pian Strostrup. I um, have been there since the beginning. Um, <laughs> that's a long time ago. I think I missed about five meetings in that time. Uh, over the years, I've tried a little bit of everything. Um, just now, uh, I'm in the uh, direction group that tries to think about uh, sort of bigger issues and longer term issues. And uh, for my sins, I'm this year's uh, chairman there. We change chairman every year. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Michael Wong. Um, I've been here pretty much since year 2000, which was really amazing. I think I've had an amazing journey and I still love it. So that speaks a lot about why I'm, I'm here. I, the things I've done, you probably have all forgotten. Things like, um, well, it wasn't all by myself, but things like generalized attributes, inheriting constructions, user-defined literals. Um, oh, and the weak, weak memory model. 
<laughs> because I had to because I had to defend it because at one point I worked for a company called IBM. You might have heard of it. That had a we very very weak memory architecture. Um, right now I'm a chair of SG14, which is the one for low latency finance, embedded, and games. And we're gonna and SG19, which is machine learning. And we're gonna hold a a live face-to-face -face ISO meeting tomorrow. Part of that is so that people can have a chance to see what it's like. And we're actually gonna triage real papers so that you can see what it means to be, see how the sausage is made. Um, in my other day job, <laughs> I'm a DE for Codeplay. Um, and um, that's it, thank you. Oh, Gabriel Dussres. Um I, uh, I work for Microsoft and I represent Microsoft France on the, uh, Center's committee. Uh, I've been there for 26 years now. Uh, some people say that I went there when I was a baby or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm mostly interested in uh, dependable softwares and, and generic programming. So I work with Bian and a couple of other people on um, concepts per uh, concept, uh, modules, and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, these days, I spend most of my time in a new study group on safety and security that Herb created. Um, I, you know, at the beginning of these cycles, that, you know, C plus plus twenty six, I was spending a lot of time on uh, on contract, but I had to uh, spend more time on, on on safety because, as we talked about that yesterday, it's really a pressing issue. Oh, and um, you know. My job at Microsoft, I just help the team uh, try to deliver uh, standard conforming compilers for you guys to, to use. So please feel free to start using the microphone and queuing up for any questions you have for our panel. And as you're starting to make your way there, I'll just throw out for anybody who wants to offer. So we've talked a lot about C++20. It had a bunch of major features. But let me ask about your favorite feature of C++23 or that you hope to get to see in 26? One each. Oh, I have easy answers. Favorite feature in 23 is MD span. It's a decade in coming. Thing I want to see the most in 26 is reflection. And I'm definitely willing to do some work on that, so. Great, thank you. Any other takers? I can go with deducing this for 23. I think it's awesome. Uh, and yeah, um, well, one, right? <laughs> it's hard. I'd like to see, well, I've been speaking about this in this conference. I'd like to see customization, uh, customizable functions maybe, or a different way for having customization between library and users. Uh, for me, 23, uh, import STD. I'm dodging 26 just now. <laughs> can, can, I, can I just say, I, I know that we've had, I, I knew the numbers from the Microsoft implementation, and, uh, and I had talked about last year how fast it was to import the whole standard library was less than the time to compile Hello World. I just recently saw numbers for the GCC implementation, and importing the entire standard library was 0 0.03 seconds. Wow. <laughs> With modules. Go ahead, Mike. Um, so I still work a lot in high performance computing, delivering supercomputers. And um, so uh, I got to I gotta say the multi-dimensional subscript operator is right there for me yeah. for 23. But there are many others like relaxing Conci valve, you know, things like that, 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 that are really important. Thank you. For 26, I am really looking forward to a feature to features that I've been working, oh, almost 10 years of my life since 2016 on in a TS, and it's gonna get there before the TS. <laughs> this is how, how time, time travel works. Um, hazard pointers and read copy update. Cool. I remember reading articles by Andre Alexandrescu about hazard pointers like a decade ago. We have a question, and then we can, I can go back to panelists. Hey, good evening. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about the best ways to keep track of uh, uh, the committee works? Like there's like 
different websites and there's Reddit and how, how would you recommend people just keep track of things and also interact It's, with the committee? And let me rephrase that slightly to anyone who wants to take this. How do you keep track of what's going on? <laughs> It's, It's gotten a lot better. Um, every year we try to make it a little bit better. It's still not perfect and it is still difficult. Um, so right now, you'll notice that there's a paper website, which I think a lot of people know what it is. And the paper website actually has revision numbers as well as previous drafts. And with, I think it actually also now have like, whether it's been accepted and is moving forward. So I think that has, really, that has really helped. The other thing that is out there is a GitHub, which advises you on the progress of paper. The problem is, of course, you, there's no real easy snapshot. Maybe there is, someone else will tell me, but you have to kind of stitch it all kind of together, which takes some time, unless you have the context that we have, which is we go to the meetings and we, 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 lived, we lived the life and we, we, you know, I'm hoping other people can give me more, but this is what I, this is what I do. Um, I personally find it impossible to keep up with everything. And uh, that's unfortunate because if I have a job in the committee, it is to keep an overview and to figure out what, what's happening. Um, if you are interested in a single issue, it's not that hard. You find the paper and you, you, you track what that's going. But if you want to figure out how, say, a uh, library faci facility that's proposed uh, will interact with a uh, core language feature that's being proposed, then it becomes really uh, quite quite difficult. Uh, the problem is we have, what, we have 400 uh, members or so, and uh, at least 250 are active and doing things that are mostly good, but sometimes we put our feet in it And um, it's, it's hard to keep track of. It's a good question, thank you. Um, I think a lot of people publish reports after every committee meeting. I know that Herb does. Somebody does on Reddit, it's a, it's a group effort, isn't it? Um, keeping track of everything that's happening in the committee may be counterproductive because not all papers do get accepted. However, those that do get accepted always end up in minutes, <laughs> which are published. And those minutes tend to have straw polls and links to the papers that have been accepted. So that's also one way of keeping track on what's new in C++. Yeah, who, who, and who where do you find the minutes? They're, they're available on ISO CPP, aren't they? Yeah. And, and, who, and who writes the, the plenary meeting minutes and with those polls? Okay, thank you. Yeah. And they always have the Oxford commas in place. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, I have a couple of answers that are, that are more nuanced. Like, one answer is, like, if you ha don't have a reason to keep up with the committee, um, maybe focus on other things and, like, follow C++ educators, right? Because, like, the committee's job is not to educate. It's the, there's a lot of fantastic educators, many of whom are speaking at this conference, many of whom are not involved in the committee, actually, right? Um, they take what we do at these committee meetings and turn it into things that people can understand. The other side of that coin is I've talked to like four or five people in, in the hallways today who say they read every single paper that comes from the committee every single time and have not been to a committee meeting yet. And I'm like, I have, I think I maybe read every single paper once, like my first committee meeting because I was scared. But like, I don't know anyone on the committee who does that. So like, if you're doing that and you're that into the committee, um, yeah, please come. Please, seriously. We need that energy. <laughs> all right, I have a bit of a long answer. First of all, Harry. <laughs> uh, yes, I forgot to mention, I'm also the Israeli NB chair, and Harry is, uh, is, is one of our you know, more active uh, um, co community um, members. So I have a few things. Uh, first of all, I just recently became LEWG uh, chair, Library Evolution, and before that I was SG9 chair. And what you're bringing up is really important in, in not just externally, but also internally. Um, I feel that in order to do our work uh, well, we need to be able to inform. And I just had a meeting with a few of 
the attendees here of how do we improve that as well, um, generally speaking. But as you know, as an ex you know, getting generally informed. So we have a GitHub which is quite active, and I. I mean, for me at least, it's very important. I uh, post there every after every meeting. LAWG meetings are being summarized and posted there. It's true that we have minutes, but the minutes are not uh, available uh, for everyone. And main reasons is we want to allow our experts to have uh, you know honest opinion and not to be uh, impacted by um, you know their uh, employers or anything other. Uh, and I think this is actually important, but we do try to summarize uh, anonymously and we do publish the polls on GitHub as well, at least I'd hope um, in a consistent way. <clears throat> Sorry. And one more thing is that af after every uh, committee meeting, I at least uh, some of us, uh, Bryce in the, in the past and now I am trying to uh, post a very, very detailed Reddit post that summarizes every paper that's been discussed. And you can go there and see the status, and it also links to the GitHub. And you know, I hope that helps. Uh, I used to use car color coding <laughs> and Excel's, but I think that's better. Um, yes, yeah, so I hope that helps. And you know, and on a personal note, I mean, I'll be happy. You know, if you join our meetings, and I'll be happy to have you more involved. So, and thanks. as Michael said, you'll have a chance to see how a committee meeting works in this building tomorrow afternoon. So look for the SG14 meeting. Um, technically, ISO requires uh, only members and the guests, any guests who are not members have to be invited by the convener. You're invited. So, uh, next question, please. Hey, uh, thanks so much for doing this panel. Um, and uh, so my question, I originally thought uh, might have been a loaded question or potentially unfair, um, but uh, Daisy brought it up, so uh, I, I assume it's fine. Um, so uh, I have been, I'm sure I'm not the only person that's thought about this. I've wanted to write an automatic serialization library for so long at this point now. Um, and a couple years back, I was following Reflection, like we went through multiple different iterations of it. We had type-based stuff with metaprogramming. We had value-based stuff with, uh, val uh, sorry, value-based stuff with const expert, I kind of got busy with life and stopped fo following it at that point. Like, is reflection in 26 actually a realistic goal at this point? Like, is that something we think will happen? Or I'm just kind of curious what the state there is at this point. Thank you. Do you mind if I start with this one? Yeah, okay. Um, so the, the two people that are best to ask about that are not here. Um, the third person who's best to ask that about that is here, but is not in the room. Um, but, uh, but they are going to be in Kona, so that's good. They, yes, they <laughs> are going to be in Kona. So yeah, it, like you said, kind of life happens and, and, and lo you lost track of things. That also happens to authors of C++ papers sometimes. Um, and sometimes things need to get pushed forward or moved on. Um, I certainly had several conversations in Varna with people uh, asking if there was any way I could help um, with that paper. That's something that I could probably get myself to do. Um, and just to decode for those in the room, Varna is the June meeting, the most recent ISO C++ meeting we just had in Varna, Bulgaria. But it, it needs help, um, but it needs very targeted and specific help and not a, a shotgun of a lot of answers a lot of options, because right? I think we went through the shotgun of a lot of options already once, and now we just need to, to some of them have been picked, we've had polls and things like this, and um, we need to, to move forward on those. Um, I think we need to, my opinion, honestly, is we need to break it up more and get the things that we can get into 26 into 26. Can I um, jump in in the queue? Uh, Gabby, you've been waiting a while. Let's have you next, please. Oh. I think the short answer is nobody here knows. Uh, in fact, nobody knows uh, whether a specific proposal will get into the standard until it is approved by the committee in plenary. And even when something is approved into the working draft, which is the in, in progress uh, standard, um, you still have to keep an eye on it. Um, now, I've been author of several proposals that have been voted in and taken out, so <laughs> I'm talking from experience. Um, 
if you need something to get in there, uh, you need to get involved either directly by participating or by finding something, someone in your national body's representative and helping them make the right arguments uh, because there are a lot of questions and, and find the right answers to get it in. But as of today, I don't think anybody here can tell you, yes, it will make it or will not make it. And we have a queue. So if you can queue right up to the mic, it's it easier for me to see. Yeah. So well, let's have the next question. Please. Um, I just want to add one thing. Um, 26 will happen. We ship on time. We just can't say exactly what's in it uh, because, well, it has to get ready and uh, agreed and create some consensus before we're willing to put it in because we can't get it out again. And, and one more from Inbal, and then we'll have a question. I actually do want to address this one as well, because I've actually um, been trying to promote this, because I also, also think it's very important. So by the way, thank you for the question. Um, so a few things. First of all, um, I will say the best factor for uh, committee, uh, for, for uh, features in C++ is very low. So as Daisy has been mentioning, and uh, some people, have, can can pull this off, but we also need help. But the problem is that not everyone have you know not everyone are compiler implementers, and this is required. But also we need other sides of that, which is the usability, the people that are using that. So I've actually been um, again it's been bothering me, and I've started a group a few months ago. I think maybe half a year already. I'm not sure. We're meeting every two weeks, um, and there's a lot of people from Bloomberg there, but a lot of people, it's actually started from a national body, so a lot of national body members. And we've been uh, working on the different aspects of that, but mostly on the other side, like we had a paper from um, examples from Python binding that tries to show the usability and other things as well. Yeah, so that's one thing that came up from this group. So. Uh, as people have said this, and I think uh, have said here, and I think it's very, very uh, true, if you care about something, we need your help. Um, and again, if you want to reach out, that would be great. If you want to reach out, we can also connect it with whoever that is relevant or less relevant or more and do whatever aspect that you care about. But you don't have to be a compiler implementer to help reflection um, because there's other aspects in reflection. So, yeah. That's it. Great, thank you. Please go ahead. Yeah, th uh, this is well. Uh, I have a really beginner questions, so I'm planning to attend the first committee meeting meeting in this November. But Welcome. what should I prepare? Like, should I prepare mentally, technically, and how does the committee meeting week look like? What should I prepare? Yep. Um, so if you have registered for the uh, first committee meeting, you'll probably get an email from me about a few days before that, that will summarize a few things that happen at the committee meeting, like the plenary, there's usually an introduction meeting on a Sunday that's run by Jens, that kind of tells you what meeting rooms to go to, who to speak to, and where you can find things. Um, we have a plenary meeting at the beginning of a meeting, uh, at the beginning that will tell you the schedule for the week, when different groups meet. Um, and then, then we go away, we meet during the week, and at the end, we do uh, voting. A good thing to do would be to just look into the papers that are in the la latest mailing, which is, la is the mailings pop they are public? They're not, are they? It, they're on the 15th, so in they're a couple of weeks. They are public, yeah. Are public. Yes. So look into the latest mailing, see whether there are any papers that you're interested in, and just find either me or you'll, you'll meet other people there and we'll tell you what we'll be discussing and where you can find the agenda. After Pablo, go ahead. Uh, I'll point out that there is a, a kind of a bewildering number of websites that have little fragments of information, including a wiki that you get access to once you join the committee, you get the password to, to get to the wiki. Each of the subgroups posts their deliberations on this wiki, and they do their best to put their schedule for the week on the wiki so that you have a fighting chance of being in the room when the paper that you're interested in um, is talked about. And it sometimes helps to, 
to if you're if you're floating among rooms, which I totally suggest for for someone beginning, uh, you know, a beginner at the at the meetings, is to to go to the different rooms, go to different study groups and work groups um, to see what they're like. You know, some people find a home in one or two groups, and some people float forever. But um, that if you are floating around, but there is a particular paper or two that you're particularly interested in. Talk to the chairperson of that particular group and let them know that you want to try and be in the room when that is discussed. We do have a uh, a, a chat um, on. Does it matter most now? <laughs> um, where where uh, you can you can do instant messaging as well as group messaging. Uh, so you can follow what's going on in the groups that way. Uh, if you're in one room and you want to see what's happening in the other room, you can follow their discussion a little bit. In the, in the matter most. And if you have a friend in a room or make a friend in the room to say, call me, send me an instant message <laughs> when this paper is coming up, then you have a chance of being in that room. But, but yes, following, following the papers that you're most interested in is probably the, the smartest way to go. Okay. I'm gonna go super specific, but wait, wait, are you one of Professor Wong's student from Madison or Utah? I'm from Lawrence Berkeley National. Oh, from Law. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Cause I, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Uh, and next, please. Hi. Um, I, I have a question that comes from a bitter place that I think is familiar to most of you, which is uh, when a paper comes and you think it's bad, right? And then the situation happens. So I tried reaching out to people. But usually people don't want to hear that their paper is bad, or if you can't convince them, you're kind of stuck. You have to do all the same work that the paper author, right, just to see something not happen. So I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on how maybe the disbalance should be pushed to the people who could, like, protesting should be easier, maybe. Or what are your thoughts on this? Thank you. <laughs> we actually have a situation going on right now where a paper was voted that to be to not proceed, but the author keeps going. Okay, um, we don't have, as, as this. This sort of tells you what, what as chairs the kind of powers we 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 actually don't have. We we can't stop paper being heard. In fact, it's one of the greatest sin of the committee is to stop people from be, from expressing themselves. And we do everything we can, even if we think that something isn't going to go forward. The, 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 the committee, the group, will, will, will opine in a way that, that, that will give people the idea that this is not going to go forward. And we often, when we vote, we, of, we often say things like, proceed at your own risk. You know, we don't think this is going to go make, make I think I learned that from Biana in the first couple of days, you know, proceed at your own risk. And this happens, this will happen, nothing personal. You know, it's happened to me. It's probably happened to every one of us. Um, you pointed out something very uh, crucial, which was that you to oppose something, you have to spend as much time as the proposer. But the proposer has much more motivation um, than, than you have as to be negative. And we don't like to be negative. We don't like to spend time on things we think are, are wrong, which means that uh, a proponent comes into the room with a 10 to 1 advantage. And if we don't like it, the proposer is likely to come again. And so um, it's, it's difficult, it's time consuming, it's necessary, um, if nothing else, because we consider ourselves nice people. And, uh, well, sometimes something that we don't all like slips through, but, but you put your finger on an on a important problem. I'm going to take the opposite approach of Bjarna here. Um, I, I honestly think that, yes, it, it takes, you know, as much time to oppose something as it does to author something. Um, and I think that's by design, because if, if if we uh, let the perfect be the enemy of the good in the standard, then we will not get anywhere. And I say that as an author of executors, um, you know, 
for several different iterations. Um, I say that as an author of a paper that got into the standard after 10 years. It was literally P0009, mm -hmm. and it got into C23. Um, so I don't know if you have any context on when we started numbering papers with Ps. It is one of the very first ones. We're on what, P3000 something now? Right, we're right at the 3000 yeah. cusp. Yeah, right around 3000. Um, so what, 2,900 papers have, have gone through the committee in the time it took to get this paper done. And I saw a lot of people who were like, I don't like this. And I was like, great, I would love to hear your alternative, but, and then they were like, I don't have time to put together an alternative. And I'm like, well, then we have to stick with what we have. Um, I know that's not entirely how the committee works. Sometimes when you have an objection, it just, something just stops. And I wish it worked less like that. Okay, I'll be brief. Um, I agree with what been mentioned here. I think that I think that's that's important that when you do have objection, it will be based on on the rationale have to be clear and coherent, and it's important because people have been working on this and they've put in a lot of effort. I don't think that it means that anything that anyone have ever worked on should go into the standards. But if your rationale is coherent and that you know, express it with uh, respect to the other person that's been working this hard. Um, and then you're gonna convince the room and then the thing's not gonna pass, hopefully. But we, we can never, as also been mentioned here as, as chairs, for example, we can never block things. It's not our role. We need to, in the way I perceive it, we need to allow a constructive discussion um, Discussion, sorry. <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, constructive discussion. And, and this is, I think, the most important thing. And this constructive discussion have to lead to concrete resolution, which is not based on any personal um, uh, aspects. And, and, and this is very important. I think Bjarne was ready to weigh in. Yeah. Um, I'd like to offer a little bit of advice to people who uh, wants to get something into the language. Um, the papers that has the worst time are the ones that comes in, shows uh, facility, shows, uh, says it's great, shows all the technicalities, and then expect the committee to figure out what it's good for. That is, uh, uh, to make a paper that, that I would like, uh, you, you, you have to explain the motivation. What is the problem being solved? What are the alternative solutions? Does it need to be a language feature? Does it need to be in the standard? Is it best done as a library? Who's going to use it? What level of users? What education of users? Um, and after that, I can evaluate the technical solution. But without that information, I just look at a piece of technical stuff and think, what an Earth is that for? Who is it for? Uh, one more, and then we'll take a question. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I, the, I just wanted to quickly clarify what I was saying. One of the things that I, the, what I meant there was that there are a number of things in the standard that we have repeatedly taken votes on that the room said, we want some version of this. And then we repeatedly propose options and people say, I don't like that option. I don't like that option. I don't like that option. Right, so there, there are other things that we have taken votes on and said, we're not even sure if we want this in C++. That's a different discussion. I think those things, it's, it's a very much, the, the bar is much lower for rejecting those things. But when the room says repeatedly, the SG1, the, the parallelism and concurrency study group, and then the uh, library evolution working group repeatedly takes votes that are over, overwhelmingly, we want executors in some form but then rejects every single proposal to put it in. Um, I think we have to be, we have to work to be balanced on seeing alternatives um, to an extent and then not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, so. Yeah, well put. Please, next question. So you guys see many different papers and many different proposals, but from time to time you 
dictate optimizations, you know, famously like vector of bool. And now it seems like there's some controversy with the, um, the caching for ranges. So I'm just curious, like, what's the discussion that goes on? How do you decide when an optimization needs to be in the standard versus just left up to the implementers? Oh, nice question. <laughs> Gabby looks like he's getting ready to say something. <laughs> I, I, I have one comment for starters. Vector of bool were uh, done in the uh, early 90s. That's a long time ago. And it is not a good example of how the committee has worked this millennium. That, 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 that's true, but he did also cite a current example. So. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were getting ready to say something, Gabby. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Shows you how hard it is. <laughs> I'll, I'll try something. I mean, I can say something if no one else. I, 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 let me, let me, I don't, I don't have a lot to say on the subject, but the, the committee tries not to dictate optimizations in general. That's, that, is, that is something that if we feel like we're doing that, if somebody raises their hand and says, that looks like we're dictating optimizations, people take a step back and say, oh, yeah, that's not really what we're about. But we do are definitely in the business a lot of is allowing optimization. Um, and so the kind of things that we would consider is, you know, is it impossible to do this concurrently? If, if we make this little change, we're able, somebody is able to do it concurrently and therefore we should allow that optimization. And it may make the interface maybe a little harder to use or maybe add an extra knob that is a little ugly, but allows that optimization, then we'll, you know, there's a trade-off that will be considered and there'll just be discussion and, and things like that. You cited the, the example of caching in ranges, which I was not in the room for that discussion, but my understanding is that the issue is not mandating an optimization or forbidding an optimization, but rather, would, can we allow this optimization without compromising the interface. And, and the issue there for people who are not aware of it is that if you pass a range that has caching in it by const reference, you have, the, the, the cache is, is a mutable part of that range. And so it's not really const or either that or it's not usable. It's either really const and not usable because it, it has a, a mutable cache or it's lying to you and it's mutating things under the covers and calling itself const. And that is a tough choice because you want to allow the optimization um, or you want to allow the functionality. Some of it's not even optimization. Some of it's actual functionality that requires it to keep state. Um, but it makes it a little bit less usable. And so that's the debate. And as far as I know, um, it's, still, it's still an ongoing debate. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so as was pointed out, the committee actually doesn't dictate optimization. At least the way we define optimization is they just, you know, transformations that are allowed and, you know, you shouldn't be able to see the difference. There are, however, uh, situations where sometimes we do something, we decide on something and we call it an optimization, but it is not technically an optimization. Um, an example is um, uh, something that uh, after we got move semantics, Richard Smith works on what we call guaranteed copy um, uh, elision. And, and to some degree, it's not an optimization because there is no copy to elide in the first place. <laughs> so it's a misnomer. And, and the same way, named return value that Biani invented I thought you, you, you made that. <laughs> I did the okay, you did the unnamed version. <laughs> um, so if, if you want it to be pedantic, it's not actually an optimization because when the compiler does the you know, <laughs> optimization, you see difference in the program behavior either because the copy constructor is no longer called and if you're keeping a count on the side, that count doesn't you know, materialize, that sort of things. But when those design decisions are made, most of the time it is because they open the door to new programming technique. So going back to the example that I, I took earlier, guaranteed copy elision, 
it is about like if you have a, a type that you cannot copy, let's say a file handle, like you opening a file, you don't really copy a file, you just want to pass the handle around leaving the, the file on, on disk. So you want to have a move, something that effect. There is no copy to Elide. So being able to call a function that opens a file, that's sending to check, and then return a handle to the caller is a new programming technique that you can deploy easily in your day-to-day -day programming if that design decision is accepted. So that's one of the cases that I remember. We did these things, and we call it optimization, but it's really not an optimization. It is enabling new programming technique. Thank you. Uh, our next question, please. Hey, what do you think is the most elegant or the most confusing part of the C++ standard? Let's go with elegant. <laughs> Great question. Anything where you say, ah, oh, this is beautiful. Uh, most elegant, I'll say the pairing of constructor and destructor. Um, every single time that I sit down and write code with my, my, my friends and or, or colleagues, and I want to make sure that I'm not leaking resources, and, and I, it's, it's the first thing that I do. When I go to other programming languages, like I've written a lot of Haskell, I'm like, oh, okay, I have to make sure that I have this monad that you know, it, it's complicated. I, I write Python. I'm not picking up Python. It, it, you know, or you go to Java. Eventually, they, they found ways of writing that. So for me, that's most elegant. And it did from, you know, 40 will, years ago. I will just point out that we are at the exact halfway point before the M word was used. You need to put a dollar in the swear jar. <laughs> just kidding. Go ahead. Uh, destructors and the multiple constructors was what happened in the second week, I think, of uh, the C++ civil classes design. This is, this is the bedrock of C++. I'm, I'm going to go non-technical and say that the limerick is my favorite part of the standard. <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to Google it to, to quote it correctly, but it goes something like this. When writing, a sp when writing a specialization, be careful about its location, or to make it compile will be such a trial to kindle a self-immolation. Thank you, Andy Koenig. I, <laughs> so uh, this limerick is in, um, in normative text in the standard. It was put in in the very last uh, seg uh, segment, uh, se se uh, minute, uh, by Andy Koenig the night before we voted out the uh, C++ 98 standard. And the reason it survived is I wrote the rest of that paragraph. It is designed to be the most boring paragraph in the uh, standard. Uh, designed to make you go and sleep and uh, not see the limerick at the end. Uh, you, you can try and look up self impolation uh, Try and read from the beginning of the paragraph and see if you can get to the end. Uh, but since it is normative, everything in that paragraph uh, is supposed to be true and valid. And I believe it was at least last time I looked at it. Uh, yes, and you wrote that carefully to make sure that all of that other text, because it was normative, had no effect. Exactly. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's like that diplomat in the Foundation Trilogy who speaks for a week and says nothing. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to answer the second part of the question of uh, what I find the, the sort of maybe least elegant uh, part of the standard, and that is that the the template programming language is so different from the rest of the programming language. It's a kind of a functional programming language using angle brackets, not for less than and greater than. Um, you know, I, I, I see how it evolved there. It didn't, it didn't start as a programming language. It started as a way of getting generic containers and things like that. And so it, it evolved into this thing that you can actually program in and it generates code at compile time. Um, but, it, but because of that, it doesn't look like C++. That's changing a little bit 
um, with auto and the and, and with concepts uh, the, the, the the short names and with const expert where you can do things at compile time in something that looks like C++ because it is C++. Um, so that's kind of a nice evolution uh, in terms of smoothing out the rough edges of the language. That was no accident. <laughs> I, I actually, it's interesting that you specifically say that because I think one of the most elegant things I've seen recently since I've been involved in the committee um, or relatively recently was the addition of explicit template parameters um, to uh, lambdas. Um, it was a very specific thing, I think, that solved a lot of problems, uh, particularly in terms of being able to get uh, index sequences um, locally without having to add extra overloads. Um, and then deducing this along the same lines uh, is just an incredibly elegant solution, I think, uh, in the confines of implementing a practical language, right? I think we can have much more elegant solutions to any of these things in uh, Haskell or other languages that are not as widely used. I was gonna say not used, but you know. Um, and then I would say the most confusing, which is not the most inelegant, it's actually quite elegant, but I think it's the most confusing to me uh, is uh, the memory model. Um, I think there is a reason why it is, is complex. It needs to be complex. You don't need to understand it unless you need to understand it. Um, but uh, I think it's very well done, but it, it is very confusing. I have to, uh, now I have to speak up. <laughs> I find the, the memory model most elegant. <laughs> I didn't say it was inelegant. I said it was confusing. Thank you. Yeah, how much of that was the weak part? Never mind. <laughs> And since I've started speaking, I'm going to continue to speak and say that, you know, for me, C++ is always, um, when I find elegance, I guess, when I find that there's functionality that's unanticipated and it's being used in ways that we don't anticipate. Early on, we've seen that, you know, templates could be used to do compile time programming. That was a kind of a discovery that was sort of unanticipated. Recently, with lambdas, you, I have learned to, to love lambdas because now we can do some magical things with them. Like, you know, they, in, initially they were always designed to be able to, as, as a throw off function that you can, you can send off to another thread and, and then you, you don't have to worry too much about it. And that's, a, that's great, but we are now also using it for things like heterog heterogeneous dispatch, offloading to accelerators, because it works, it just works. Now, we, there's some little baggages there too, but I, f I love C++ being able to do things that, that the designers, I don't think they anticipated some of these things. Please go ahead, next question. Oh, Bjarne, and then next question. Uh, I'd like to point out that um, lambdas really are an elegant uh, notation for function objects. And function objects were back in the early days, and it was one of the reasons we have overloading. It uh, came in uh, together with subscript notation, and um, before plus and minus. <laughs> Please. Hi, I'm back again, thought of another question. Um, so, um, one thing I'm wondering about, so uh, people have been talking a lot recently about coroutines, obviously we have support for that now. Like, I think that there's, an enormous amount of opportunity to make, you know, like uh, IO more efficient, like, you know, you can, the thread goes off and does something else while it's waiting on the IO to become available. Um, I think it's a very powerful abstraction. Um, one thing though that I'm personally concerned about is just that, like imagine, you know, some way down the line or something like that, you have a code base that is built very, very heavily on coroutines. Um, like the thing that I'm concerned about is debugability, essentially. Like a situation where, you know, you have like a co-await or something like that, that's gonna dispatch back into the scheduler and God knows where control flow goes from that point. And so I don't know that that necessarily has to be a problem. Like if GDB is aware of coroutines and like if the tooling itself is made aware of this, um, then I think that that doesn't necessarily have to be a problem. Um, but at least when I was trying to work originally with the coroutines TS back in the day with GDB, it's almost impossible. And so my question is like, what level, like 
how does the tooling kind of play into this? Like, how do you guys consider that? Um, is there consideration that happens there? Like, is basically, I'm just wondering, like, is there thought that's given to this? What thought is given to this? And like, just do we think that 10 years down the line, GDB and other debuggers will be coroutine aware and this will be not a problem at all? I'm just kind of curious. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have a tooling study group um, and there are lots of people who seem to want to weigh in on, on answering. Who wants to go first? Um, okay, so uh, specific on coroutines, I happen to work with the Gordon Shanoff, the person who uh, designed and pushed coroutines through. He did work with the debugger team, and that was a, an explicit consideration. Um, it, it, it is true that when you have a heavy use of coroutines following threads, and, and it can be uh, challenging, I, I acknowledge that. Uh, in general, Implementability is a concern, and ease of use is a concern for uh, the committee in, in, in general. And I've seen uh, proposals go down because uh, implementers uh, express concerns. I've seen proposals go down because educators uh, express concerns. Uh, at some point, uh, we, we make a trade-off, like we know this is the state of the tooling today. Is there a reasonable path, as we have experts in the room, do they believe that, you know, in reasonable amount of time, the technology will mature enough to support the vision of the proposal? And all of those things get considered. Um, I know you talk about co-routine, but you point to something that is very dear to, to me, which is, as we put uh, proposal stuff into the standard, uh, what, what, what is the rate of, of uh, adoptability? Like we're going, we, we already started C++ 26. How many here are actively using C++ 20 in their code base? Okay, well, that's, that's a lot more than I expected. <laughs> yes, a lot more Tell than your I, friends. I'm sorry? Oh, I just, I just interjected. Tell your friends. Yes, <laughs> yes, tell your friends. So, um, having the tool set keep up with the work that the committee is doing so that people have confidence in deployment, like production deployment is, is an important aspect. On the other hand, if we wait for the tool set to catch up before we can do anything, we'll be dead. it will be dead language. So, there is a, some kind of uh, balance trade-off to, uh, to distract there. Could I suggest, answer something else if you like, but to, to focus that question in, what about the linker part of the tool? Yes. <laughs> the, 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 the C linker, for example. Yeah, so traditionally, um, we have always thought, well, we can't touch the C linker, so whatever you're doing, make sure your proposal fits the C linker model. In practice, at least as far as I remember, when I got involved in, in GCC back in 1997, the, the state of the art was already that you have to go beyond the C linker. So when I did modules, for example, in my mind, it has to go through the entire tool chain. So the implementation that we have in the Microsoft compiler you, you get the front end, you get the back end, but you also get the linker change so that we can actually have a better support for, for the language. So yeah, the linker also gets to change and we need to get people accept that. Um, go, going back to uh, cool routines, uh, yes, it will become a problem and yes, the tools and debuggers will emerge. But there is something um, that I can say based on my experience because uh, coroutines, the earlier version, uh, was my bread and butter for about 10 years. And it is actually easier to debug well-designed coroutines because they're smaller. And because you don't have all of that crud on the side that saves your state and restores your state and store it over there. The, the, the fundamental facility of a coroutine is that it keeps track of its state and you don't have to do it. And also you tend to organize your program 
in terms of hundreds or thousands of coroutines, and they are small, they're like small functions, and, and that'll help you. Whichever of you would like to go. Um, yeah, so one thing that you did say that I, that really I wanted to comment on is that like you were you're working with very early on, right? Um, based on your earlier question and now this question, um, you're just gonna encounter this a lot. Um, like if you wanna be on the fringes of C++ and you wanna be pushing the language and be working on the edge, then you're gonna encounter this a lot. But like writing coroutine tooling and debugging, is, like who's debugged a, a coroutine in Python before? Anyway, yeah, it's not hard, is it? Not at all, right? It's like, it's like going in and out of a function, right? Like the tooling will get there. We need to be intentional about it, but if you are gonna work on it with a feature that's not ready yet, like I think I'm probably one of the few people who has written more concepts with the concept bool syntax than with the concept syntax um, because I was working with Eric Niebler on executor stuff early on before we had non-concept bool syntax. Um, like you're gonna have to deal with some of that. And, and, and that's, just try and enjoy it. <laughs> but like, I don't think we need to solve the problem of having tooling ready when the feature is ready or when the feature is being developed. I think we do need to solve the problem of having tooling ready before people are using it widely. And that's a different discussion. Can I offer to redirect it in a, in a user facing way this time, not the linker? and in the future. So as we have interest in reflection, in compile time functions, one of the things I have asked about, and I, but I would like to know what you think about, is how do I debug a, a compile time function that really runs a compile time? How do I step into, a, and, and the level of, of support for that, of course it's coming and it will come, but uh, what are your thoughts on the, the current state of the art, the, the velocity that we're getting to solve the compile time programming tooling parts from the user's point of view? Can I can I catch that one? Okay, <laughs> I had I had a lot of thoughts of that. Um, it's actually more from the aspect of static analysis uh, tools, but I think it's related um, because I've been thinking about this as well. Sorry, uh, I think there's so and also to kind of connect that to the to your question, so. You know, we have features, not all of them are simple. This is what we're trying to do. This is a, a system, uh, a language, and um, that means that we're gonna have to, you know, we have to deal with uh, complex things. One idea that I have, and it really wild, not something that is in any way, I mean, not in any way being um, uh, experienced, uh, experimented or, or something, but like interactive compiler maybe, uh, to address your, your question, uh, because at the end of the day, I, I mean, the model is pretty simple. You, you have a machine, you have your source code, which tries to basically, at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is explain to, to, to the machine with the source code what you want the machine to do. And this, and, and I think it's more than it's, um, you know, the question of, the technical solution for us, uh, you know, being able to debug compile time, it's about how do we um, make sure that this communication channel is is correct or good, and like interactive compiler is, you know, one maybe possible solution for. I, I know I, I didn't mean it's not like technical thing that exists. I meant that in. I didn't do any work on this in, in my aspect, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, sorry for if I wasn't clear. <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't do any work. It was mainly on the thought side. But uh, what I'm trying to do is it's uh, one solution. It's not the only one. Um, so at the end of the day, it's, it is, those are two different problems, like delivering the good feature, the, the good technical feature, which is important because this is what we do and this is what we want to keep doing, and then Separately, which is not necessarily, by the way, as part of the scope of what the uh, committee, you know, is doing, but you know, we do have a tooling paper, um, uh, possibly um, a standard. Um, but 
The other part is how do we improve the development process, the ability of developers to interact with this thing that we call C++, but that in the end of the day, that, that's what we need in order to, and, and you know, this is the best way we found, if I could speak to the computer and tell it, you know what, do this thing and do it, that would be great, uh, but yeah. I think we have Daisy and Gabby. So has anyone else on the stage or around here used an interactive compile time debugger before? Yeah, like a few of us have. I, which one have you used? I've used template before. Template, is, I was gonna point that out. I explored yeah. this, this idea of compile time debugging for quite some time. Yeah, um, same. As a compiler writer, you have to, because at some point you mm -hmm. just get so, pull your hair out and go, God, I wish I could just walk through. What you're really doing is walking through the compiler as it's making decisions about which path to go. And that's really what you, and template is the most famous one that and there was no one called Starlight. I, or my, my probably got the name wrong, but, but there are, there are a few. They never do a really totally satisfactory job, especially with a, with a big set of code. They did, they, they do great with small sets of code so far. I don't know if they've improved it, but this was almost 15 years ago for me. No, yeah, I mean, same. I, I haven't done it in the past five years, but I have seen several, that and several tools emerging. Um, they're usually linked from Godbolt. People, uh, that I don't remember exactly the one. No, 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 not the Clang matchers. There's a, um, there's a, a like CPP Insights, I think is yeah. what it's Insight, called. Insight, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it, it is, it's like a lightweight compile time debugger that's not interactive or anything. So there are tools emerging for this. And so I, I also use um, static assert for, as a debugger for cons expert functions. And I believe Herb has a YouTube video that, that <laughs> asks a question about that, but. It's probably so you don't. I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, for context for the room, the reason we ask it is, it's, it's one thing for, for compiler writers to, to need to debug their compilers. And to some extent, you can use real debuggers, but sometimes you can't in template system and such. But where it affects you is as we enable you to write more and more compile time code, const expert functions and such, what if you really use them at compile time? Like uh, uh, you use them to compute an array size. That's static. That must be known at compile time but that code executes. So if it gives the wrong answer, you, how do you, you, your normal debugger can't just step into it to figure out what it's doing wrong because you're not at runtime yet. That's the problem. So how do we enable you to do, have that also at compile time as we enable you to write more compile time code? Uh, two, two comments here. Um, somebody I knew wrote a debugger for template instantiation so that you could walk through template instantiation I was horrified. I mean, uh, you have to do that is sort of a sign that you have done something too complicated. Okay, it was necessary because sometimes complicated things has to happen. But a lot of that became much easier once you got const expo. And um, one of the tricks for debugging a const expo function is to feed it a runtime value and then walk it through uh, as if it was a perfectly ordinary uh, function. Yes. Which, which it actually is if you don't give it a, consta a constant expression. I'll add, one, I'll add one more trick. You can also, like, in co well, const expert functions can be called in a non const, um, you know, expert context, and that's when you can actually d walk through it. I guess that's a bit of a cheat, right? You can, you can also use an ordinary assert in const expert functions. This doesn't actually help you with the type domain though, right? You, you can't do const expert functions if you need your answer to be a type. Um, so you have had uh, excellent um, answers. I'm just going to um, use a little bit on the aspect. As we put these new features into language, primarily we're enabling you as C++ programmers to write better, safer, simpler programs and be more expressive. Um, but occasionally what we also do is to push the state of the art of tool building. Um, <laughs> that guy started the whole thing when he did operator overloading for, for C++. He had, uh, yeah, Biani. <laughs> when uh, he had only the C linker that we were talking about earlier. So he had only the C linker. I don't think you had a permission to change the C linker. So he came with um, uh, a, d a device. We call it name mangling um, to, to get around it. It is not perfect, but it got the job done. Um, 
when I did uh, Cost Expert, um, I think the first time I presented was um, October 2003 uh, at the Kona meeting, and a few of uh, my friends over in, uh, in the co-working group uh, uh, gently um, s- suggested that I went and see uh, someone examine my head because uh, having a compiler is a creature function compile time is not something we do in this community. Uh, it took a while to get there. Um, then we did a uh, concept, which is once you get the concept expert model, which is now you're really wanting your compiler to go through your code and evaluate at compile time and tell you something. The next stage was concept, right? Where the compiler all the time does logical text decision based on logical conditions, operators. So we say, okay, we're inviting you to explain a little bit more at compile time. So the whole overload resolution process is less uh, opaque. If you have done Sphini, I'm not encouraging you to, if you don't know what it is, just pretend you didn't hear me. That's another dollar in the swear jar. (laughs) But if you did, you know that compiler says, I just picked this one and it is, it is mysterious. Uh, many of my friends over there in Klangland actually did a lot of work to try to get the compiler, hey, if you're making this decision, please keep a log on the side so that when I'm back to the user, I can tell them, well, I didn't pick that function because these things happen. This goes back to your question about compile time debugging, like you're explaining what actions have been taken and why. But that is not traditionally how we build C or C++ compiler. So we have both education of users, like there are a lot of you guys, millions of you guys there, and then we have education of very smart, technically astute people, very few of them, but they had a code base that is there that a lot of people depends on, and it is not easy for them to get in and say, oh, I'm doing a remodeling of my house today, I'm going to just, you know, erase everything and start over again. So how do you design these features, keep the original intent, while also making it easy for tool vendors to get to the point where they deliver a high quality tools to developers so they can actually be productive? That, that's, it's tricky. So, so how many times can you recall, or can you call an example of in the committee when we've had a discussion that compared the major implementations which had different internal data structures and made a decision not to do something or to do A instead of B because it was prohibitively expensive for one of the implementations? Could you give a, a war story? A lot. So again, you know, the one I remember vividly is, uh, was the concept, 2003, same meeting as uh, Cons Expert. Um, and the compiler writers look at, you know, both of us and say, yeah, we don't do that. And then someone suggested, well, we could dump the state of the compiler on disk. And if it fails, we'll go back and reload it again. You really don't want your compiler to work that way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to uh, comment that sometimes it goes the other way. I remember just before the vote on const expo, uh, it was deemed by an implementer being unimplementable in addition to being useless. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, we overruled that objection. Sure. One more in ball, and then next question, please. And I, I, it's not really tooling is fun to talk about. <laughs> it's actually not exactly about tooling, but a, a, you know more related to reflection. But we did mention it before, and value based reflection versus you know, type. Sorry, type ve- be- based re- versus value based, um, and again, and this is part of the things that we've been talking about post mortem. I would say because we were, I mean. And, at least for me, I only joined to this specific topic uh, quite recently, half a year ago or so. Uh, but um, some voices have suggested that you know reflection could be more usable and debuggable, and and other things as well. If we we'll keep more information, um, you know, the compiler will keep more information, and that was the whole, generally speaking, discussion about uh, type-based reflection. And um, but that would also mean that you need to sort of maintain the states. Anyway, it turned out that it's not really um, 
variable, I guess, and um, viable. viable. Sorry, yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, and you know, and we don't know that. I, I think we don't have enough experience with that. But that's a good example of of, of, of you know evaluation that we continuously doing. I would say because uh, we don't yet have it. Um, and yeah, well, you know, I I hope that we're right. <laughs> Yes, your question, please. Yeah. So I'm curious about the determination to include like completely new things into the standard. Um, one of the things that a while ago I remember talking about is general compute, like with C++ AMP and stuff like that. And it seems that you know general purpose compute with GPUs has become more and more prevalent. So what is the decision of like including it in the language versus ceding it to like vendors with CUDA or libraries like OpenCL? We have a few folks involved in some of those nouns. Um, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> I didn't put you up to it, okay? <laughs> um, yes, um, trying to um, push um, um, or have C++ advanced to heterogeneous computing is the goal of some of, our, some of the people that are on this panel, that, and I've been deeply involved in it for about seven years. I've been giving talks where I, I, I claim that C++ actually has been secretly slowly making headwaves in that direction through the addition of various kinds of things. But, and they, they, they're, they're in the forms of things like lambdas, making them more general as opposed to, um, I forget the name now, in my moment of being too old at this point. But there's changes in the in the execution model, in the memory model, so that we call them execution agents, as opposed to threads, because sometimes they're now lightweight threads. Um, that's what GPUs have. There are lots of little things. We've been tweaking along. What, when, what you're not seeing is, there, this is what we're gonna do to make accelerators work. What we're doing is what's called, what I've called a quiet revolution. And the thing that's about quiet revolutions is that we're not totally sure sometimes whether it will reach that end goal, but there's a lot, there are, a lot, there are quite a few people, I think, not, no, I wouldn't say like, you know, huge amount, but, but there are enough people in the committee who's trying to make it happen. They're taking examples from, yes, they're taking examples from CUDA, from the language that I work on, Sickle. Um, other languages like OpenCL, where they are routinely throwing um, um, offloading to accelerators. And they're taking, they're, they're trying to learn from, the, from, from those. Executors is going to make that even better. Because one of the things that's built in executors is an allowance very, very quietly for it to offload to different, those functions to different kinds of resource, resources. Even SIMD has a bit of that capability. Where is it? Did he leave? Did yeah. Matthias leave? Yeah. It's got an ABI, or at least it did the last time I looked that has an ability to allow you to abstract out the, that, that the SIMD is not just working on the CPU itself, so SIMD lanes, but it could also be GPU SIMD lanes. I, can, I have to look again to see if that ABI thing is still there. The last time it was, and that's what it was. So there are actually lots of little facilities that's have, heading there. What you can't do is totally over, overhaul C++ to make it work with accelerators. We talked about that six years ago. I came on the committee and said, let's, let's do this. And there was huge amounts of pushback that says, no, you can't do this. And for good reason. And um, you, know, what, you know, what can I do? I was only like 55 at the time. I was quite young. <laughs> Wait, we can count, Mike, we can count. Go ahead. So yeah, I mean, like when Michael started pushing that was, around my first meeting and at the time I was working in high performance computing and so I was very interested in this and I was very much on the same page he was in that oh we need you know first class discussion of accelerators in the standard and I've I've my my view has evolved on that a lot um and and I think the reason for it is that I've really started to see the standard like uh, you know a lot of languages talk about their their approach to design as like, oh, this is a batteries included language, right? And I think of, I think of C++ as a, a wiring included language, bring your own batteries, <laughs> right? And in this case, the, the accelerators are the batteries and we have this wiring that doesn't forbid you from sticking accelerator batteries in there, but we're not going to make the compiler vendors write the batteries for you. Right, we're gonna we're gonna give you the wiring 
to connect those batteries to the rest of the language so that the rest of the language can work, right? Um, but like vendors specific solutions don't belong in the standard necessarily. So right, it's generally, and that's hard. That's why progress is slow, right? Trying to write something that is generically applicable in the term, in the case of executors, that's been a, a lot of discussion. Like, oh, if we change this one thing to be const, or if we change this thing to be non-const, um, then the whole thing won't work on accelerators. Like, I've had hour and a half meetings that that were like that. And um, on Saturday mornings, by the way, so this is this is the kind of thing that some of the C++ committee people do when they're really passionate about things. Um, not that that's healthy, that's another discussion. But it, so that's my view of this. That's, that's how my view has evolved from when I started working on it with Michael very, like, as a very junior committee member and very grateful to Michael for including me in that, to be clear. I don't know that I've ever said that publicly, but um, yeah, uh, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Bjorn, it looked like you wanted to say something. Yeah, um, I just want to generalize one bit from this. And that is, when we talk about language design, when we talk about standardization, we tend to operate on, on two different levels. There's sort of the big idea level, like how do we do resource management? How do we do concurrency? How do we do generic programming? And that's what people talk about, and that's sort of the, the big, uh, what does you call it, marquee uh, features. And then there's the other level of all the little things to, to make it work properly and to interoperate between all the big things. Because uh, we, we need one language, and if we have one language, all the big things has to work together. And, and that's a big, hard question, but we are trying and sometimes succeeding. Okay, let's take Pablo, and then I'd like to move on. I, we have three people in the queue, and I'm, I'm looking at the clock to make sure we're trying to get everybody. Just to start, try to put a fine point on the sort of the, the dif difficulty in accommodating accelerators um, <clears throat> is that, well, first of all, it's a very, very fast-moving target, right? <clears throat> there's been, in some ways, there's been some convergence, like some GPUs, that the individual processing units have gotten so powerful that they're almost general purpose processing units, right? During the time that we've been trying to accommodate them. So, it, so there's been a little convergence in that direction. But there's other things, there's so many different kinds of accelerators, new ones being invented every day, and they have different constraints where they want to, each to work, they want to subset the language. And subsetting the language is a huge problem for us. Um, and so, for example, an F FPGA doesn't really work with virtual functions and function pointers. Um, and uh, uh, massively, uh, massively parallel systems like uh, GPUs, you would think they would, that, that uh, thread local storage would be good for them, but that's terrible. I mean, you really want to get rid of thread local storage. And I think, in fact, I think thread local storage is really holding us back. Um, and so it's like, some want to get rid of you know, thread local storage for this a subset, the language that way. Like for this particular processor, you don't want thread local storage. For this one, you don't want virtual functions. And it's very difficult to do this in a very general, general way. And we haven't figured out a way to do that so that you can write code once. Yeah, an international standard is, ten, is for roughly forever. And if the target is fa still fast moving and, and, <clears throat> and in motion, there's, there's a mismatch. I just want to address uh, what uh, Pablo was saying uh, because, uh, and again, I want to bring up the static analysis uh, aspect of it. So, I mean, I, I, I had a talk about abstraction layers. I think I've been <laughs> talking with a lot of people here about that. And I think that maybe not um, uh, subsidizing the language, but subsidizing the tools that we have for a specific project is maybe an interesting direction for that uh, because what? Yeah, go on. Oh, no. I mean, anyway, yeah, that, that's that's a, one of the things that I thought that could actually solve a few of the things that came up here, possibly. Um, right. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, is working on the, stand, uh, on the standards committee is full-time job 
for you? Could it be? And how do you balance it uh, along a side with your primary job? And uh, which do you prefer more? <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with Nina. I'm, I'm kind of glad that you asked that question because one of the things that I wanted to say throughout the evening is that everybody on the committee is a volunteer. So sometimes you get certain features not moving forward or certain papers no, not moving forward and people say, well, why, why, don't you just, why doesn't the committee just get it done? And the answer is because it isn't our full-time job. Everybody just commits their free, uh, gives their free time, volunteers their free time to work on the issues that they think are important, the issues that they want to see done, the things that they're passionate about. Sorry, what is free time? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you're... You know, I had five I minutes ten years ago, so... Uh, <laughs> So some people are paid, it's part of their job, and yes. many it's not. Yes, Yarn, and, and some of us are lucky that our companies do support the work on the committee, at least give us the, the time to attend the committee meetings. But usually it's just volunteer work. Yeah, I think there was a couple of years uh, back in the 80s where uh, Bell Labs thought that this was my job. But most of the time, I was just there to support uh, de uh, developers uh, solving problems. And that's true for most of us. We have a day job. I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit, Bjarne, and I hope I'm not out of line. We can always edit this out if necessary. Uh, <laughs> haven't you retired? Have you now retired three times or four times to have more time to spend on C++? Uh, it's, um, it, it's, it's sort of a bit hard to count, but I think, uh, I think three times. I retired last year to get more time, and but then uh, now I'm a professor, so it's still not full time. I, I will also say that anyone, number of the people who do get support from their companies to work on these things are still often making career sacrifices because there's, there's not as much respect for standards work as there should be. Um, Hopefully my employer doesn't see this, but you know. Um, <laughs> hey, no, I mean, I think they sure know that I have that position. And, and the, the reality is that you have to be willing to live in that world even for the part of your time that you're not volunteering. Um, you have to really care about it. Can I actually do something? Very quickly. Looking at it from outside, it's not always clear to explain exactly what we do in the committee, especially if you're not, you know, for managers, maybe in, in some level and up. And that means, yeah, I mean, as people have said here, you know, you have to really love it and care about it and and you find the time and, you know, when you find a workplace that allows you to do it more and that gradually, <laughs> um, if, if you can. Um, and and yeah, you end up, you know, that's reality, but, um, but I think, I mean, I'd be happy if I could in one sentence say what exactly, you know, the standards is and what it is mean for C++, but it's not that, I, I find it very uh, non-trivial. Um, Nina? Yeah, um, I, I agree that uh, working on C++ requires a lot of sacrifices. Um, so career, as you point out, like if you really focus on career, WHO is probably not the fastest path to <laughs> for velocity. And uh, if you care about social life, um, when, I, when I joined the committee, uh, they will start meeting on Sunday night. It was a Sunday night meeting. And, and then they will go through and then Saturday afternoon, that was when they will unlock the door and, and let you go home. So I don't know if many people who will commit 30 years, 40 years of their life just doing that. I, I'm going to say that it just amount, amounts to respect because I do know, you know, there are a lot of people here on the committee, right here right now, that probably are somewhat are not supported by their company. And they're here because of their own volition, because of their own conviction. And I can tell you that this happened to me as well, too. I, I, I would come here because I felt that what I was doing was really right. And even if my company did not support me, I would find ways to get to, to do it. And s luckily in my career, s often my company turned, changed their directions to support where I was going. That hasn't, that might not happen for to some of you. And so you just have to 
you just have to stick with your, your, your course and your conviction. Even now, where my company fully supports what I do to come to the committee, it is basically one-tenth of my job. And, and so you just, have to figure, you just have to figure it out. Okay, Nina was waiting, and then I'm going to be the bad guy and on, move us along. On, on the other hand, uh, there's lots of nice people on the committee, so it becomes part of your social life. Yes. That's true. Can I, can I just, uh, um, one thing that I didn't say is whenever we say, you know, come and come to the committee meetings and participate, one thing that may not be clear is that none of us are in any way special in any other way other than we consistently show up for committee meetings. There isn't any such special status like being a committee member. You just come and you, you start contributing and start working on things that, are pas that you're passionate about. That's all you need to do to be a committee member. But you have to be patient. It takes time to learn how things work, to see what can get through and to push something through. We, we do have people that come in for one meeting with a bright idea, dump a paper on it, and hope for, for the rest of us to solve the problem for them. That doesn't work. You know, George Harrison was never at a committee meeting, but he knew it takes patience and time to do it right. Mm -hmm. Last question, please. Uh, I, I feel bad that I'm asking this after the last gentleman's question. That seemed like a great way to end. Um, but the, the trend I've observed in the last couple standards and just the general talks here has been a lot toward let's make more generic code, let's have stuff that's easy, you know, nice and refactored, nice and extensible. Um, but a lot of that is done with templates. And what I've noticed in trying to implement some of those philosophies is my compile times have gone out the, you know, out the window. Um, do you have any advice on how to try to stick to the modern philosophy of, of embracing all these nice features that we're adding while also keeping compile times manageable and iteration cycles nice and short? Const expand modules. And keep it simple. Not every single uh, technique that you write, you, know, you, you read on a blogosphere or the latest uh, feature needs to go in production. So, but yes, I agree. Use modules early and often. Say so, context expert modules. So, who is Mr. Const expert? Who's Mr. Module? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> you have a lot to answer for, and thank you. I, I'll also say that you don't have to use templates to be generic. Right, you can write code that is more generic, that makes better reuse of other code just using a simple function. The number of times that I see someone in code being like, well, uh, why, why did you repeat yourself here and there? And they were like, well, compile times, abstraction layers, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, I'm just asking for you to put a function that has that code in it. Um, so I, th there, is, there is some truth to what you're saying and we are aware of it and work on it, but at the same time, like, you can write better code without using more modern C++. Uh, Nina, then Pablo, and then I have one final request. I think also ConstExpert isn't always the answer. There's a great talk by David van der Woerde, which I think was also from CppCon, that talks about why ConstExpert computation can be much slower than having the same thing executed at, compile, at uh, runtime. So don't push things to constexpr that you don't need push to constexpr. And, mm -hmm. and, and watch that talk, because it's a great talk. Uh, yeah. Well, I can recommend Vittorio's, sorry, just very briefly. Um, uh, Vittorio's talk uh, that he gave in course CPP in our conference, and it was also focused on uh, minimizing compile time. Really great talks out there. I, I'll, I'll just put out a, a, a plea for anybody who uh, knows compiler engineers out there, if you are one or know one, um, there needs, we, we, there's been a little bit of withdrawal of support from some very large companies for the, the big open source compilers, GCC and Clang, and they have been working hard to keep up with, say, C++23, and one of the things that has suffered has been the efficiency of the compiler it's, the compilers themselves, that, that, that you know, it's just not the fastest code. They, did, they didn't try three different data structures. They just, the first one that worked is the one that's, that they got. And the reason is we really need more compiler engineers to learn those, the code bases to, to uh, you know, work on that. And I, I'll say that my client Bloomberg is, is starting an initiative where we are beginning to look 
to we, I shouldn't say we because they are my client, Bloomberg is looking to put money into the those two open source compilers to try and get them better. And one of the, that means reducing their issues list, but also things like making things that are slow faster. Well, I, I want to thank everybody who's been on the panel, everybody who's asked questions, and all of you for staying late at night on a, on a, a long week of CPPCon talks. Uh, but just before we end, could I, could I just do this? Everybody, all of you who, who are not on stage, who have ever attended a standards meeting or a subgroup meeting, who have ever written an ISO proposal, could you just stand up for a moment, please? All of you who've ever attended a meeting or have written a proposal, so thank you to the panelists and to all of them as well. So thank you and to all of you for the panel tonight. <laughs>